Welcome to the lecture for psychopathology. We're talking today about uh, sexual and gender identity disorders. So before we can talk about uh, the disorders, we need to kind of talk a little bit about what normal sexuality is. And notice I have normal in quotes, because I think we'll start the, que the question posed to yourself. What's normal when it comes to sexuality? Right? Uh, and I imagine if, you know, you got two people in a room and asked them what normal sexuality was, you would come up with different answers. You know, there'd be some overlap, but probably some areas of disagreement about uh, what constitutes normality, what constitutes abnormality. So we have to go back to uh, thinking about, well, how do we make those decisions? What things are we considering? How do we know what is normal? And we can try to rely on maybe some of the questions we use uh, when thinking more generally about whether behavior is normal or abnormal. One being uh, statistical, statistical deviance. So uh, behaviors that are rare are, are maybe less likely to be normal. Right? Uh, so if uh, there's some aspect of your sexuality that not a lot of people uh, are like that or do that particular thing, then it might be abnormal. Right? Problem with that as kind of giving a straightforward answers is what is statistically deviant can change over time. Right? Some sexual practices have become more or less popular. Something normal today might be abnormal tomorrow. And if it's subject to change of kind of cultural whim, that doesn't really sound like something that we should call a uh, disorder. Maybe it's just a, a, an artifact of culture. So we think, well, maybe a clearer picture will be, will be gained if we ask if, if whatever it is causes distress. You know, if you're unhappy, you're bothered by something about your sexuality, about something about your sexual uh, attraction or your, your identity. Okay, maybe that's what we can use to decide if it's, if it's abnormal or not. But then we have to think, well, what if that distress is really a result of some intolerant society, such that if the person changed cultural settings, they move from one place to another, or just associated with different people, if they no longer experience distress, did they cure their disorder, or was it ever a disorder in the first place? Right. Um, so I think, well, okay, what, what about uh, dysfunction? You know, because we know there, there are certain biological processes associated uh, with sex. Uh, and again, we can kind of tie this back to uh, statistical deviance, where most people's uh, sexual response cycle works a certain way. But, uh, so dysfunction could be about some problem with these processes. Um, and also, there is kind of this general expectation that uh, uh, that one uh, psychological function of sex is to be pleasurable. Right? In addition to the, the biological function of procreation, it's supposed to, it's, we expect it to be something that is uh, enjoyable. And if it's not enjoyable, not pleasurable, then it's thought to be uh, uh, dysfunction. Right? Um, and then we can also think, well, if your sexual behavior causes you to violate the agreements of a society, the laws, or causes you other problems, maybe relationship difficulty, then that would also be associated with dysfunction uh, as well. Uh, but again, this, it's very uh, contextual because depending on where you're at, it might uh, influence whether or not dysfunction is present. Uh, so the point of this discussion is to kind of remind us that determining abnormality uh, of any behavior, and especially sexual behavior, is somewhat subjective and very contextual. It's for a given person in a given uh, culture at a certain point in time. Right? Um, so if we label somebody with a disorder, it's not necessarily something innate about them, but it's about a fit between them and uh, um, the, the culture and society in which, and the time in which they're, they're embedded. Okay. Uh, one more thing before we move on to d disorders. Uh, is just kind of think about is normal sexuality different for women and men? Because if it is, then we would expect psychopathology related to sexuality to be different as well. Uh, and yes and no, there are certainly some uh, uh, average differences. And with, like with most things, looking at uh, differences between men and women, uh, men tend to be more different from each other than they are different from women. Women tend to be more different from each other than they are different from men. But there are mean differences. Men show more sexual arousal and more uh, um, uh, overt uh, uh, indicators of desire than women. Women tend to put more emphasis on the relational context of sex than men. 
uh, men's self-concept, how, how they see themselves uh, regarding sex, is more tired, tied to power, independence, and aggression. Whereas women's self-concept and sexual orientation is more malleable than men's. It can, it's more likely to, to change uh, over time. Uh, so there are those differences, but then we have certain uh, things that are very similar uh, as well, uh, such that one we'll touch on later, uh, men and women report uh, similar subjective experiences uh, of orgasm. So there's that one part of the sexual response cycle, uh, indistinguishable, indistinguishable between men and women, how they uh, uh, report experiencing it. Um, so there are some differences, but there are some, some similarities as well. Um, okay. So, before we talk about uh, disorders, I'll talk a little about uh, sexual orientation, because it's usually a topic that comes up uh, in the uh, context of these discussions. So, what is sexual orientation? How, how would you define it? Uh, one answer is, well, it, it's who you have sex with. You know? So, if you have sex with people with the same biological sex as yourself, that's a homosexual orientation. If you have sex with people who are the opposite biological sex of yourself, that's a heterosexual orientation. And if you have sex with people of both biological sexes, then that's a bisexual, right? So, if we talked about sexual behavior as sexual orientation, you could... But that's not how most uh, uh, researchers and psychologists and therapists in general uh, understand sexual orientation. It's more than just about sexual behavior um, because sexual behavior, like other behavior, is multiply determined. Right? And it's not always uh, um, who you have sex with isn't always who you want to have sex with. Uh, and sexual orientation is more than just about what you do. Right? Um, so, you know, some, if you have... Uh, Sometimes you hear stories um, maybe about politicians who are, are married uh, and have kids, and then you find out later that they are having, um, uh, if, they're, if they're male uh, um, politicians, having sex w with other men. You say, oh, they're homosexual. But by the strict definition of sexual behavior, no, they're not, because they've also had sex with women. So are they bisexual? Well, maybe, maybe not. They probably wouldn't identify that way. So sexual behavior isn't uh, what sexual orientation is. It's, not, it's part of it obviously, but not entirely. Uh, the other thing to think of, um, if uh, uh, before you've uh, had sex, so when you're, you're still a virgin, does that mean you do not have a sexual orientation? Right? So you have no sexual orientation until you have sex for the first time. And at that point, now you have a sexual orientation. Most people say, no, that's not true. Of course, I know my, my sexual orientation. I knew it before I had sex. Well, if you, how could you know it without the behavior? So sexual behavior is, is insufficient. Well, maybe uh, it's who you want to have sex with, and that that would that would clarify it because you know that's uh, um, uh, you probably know that before you have sex, right? But actually, we we refer to that as sexual preference. And again, related to sexual orientation, but it's not sufficient to define uh, uh, sexual orientation. Uh, and largely because sexual preference and sexual behavior don't always match up. Right. Excuse me. Uh, so the way that uh, it's probably better understood is as some part of your identity. And that part of your identity is not just about sex. Right. So sexual orientation, you know, it's got sex in, in the title, but if we ask, uh, uh, statistically, speaking, statistically speaking, most of you are, are likely heterosexual. So we said, oh, you're heterosexual. That means uh, that all you think about is having sex with people of the opposite sex. So that, that, that's what you are. You're somebody who just wants to have sex with people of the opposite sex all the time. You're like, no, that's not, that, that's certainly that's part of me, but that's not everything about me, and um, that's certainly not all there is to my sexual orientation. Right? There's more to me than that. But when people have a sexual orientation that's other than heterosexual, we often try to simplify it as just being uh, about sex. But it's not. It's more so... A pattern of emotional, romantic, uh, and or sexual attraction, typically defined by the biolo biological sex uh, of the object or objects of attraction. So it's, it is about sexual attraction, but it's also about romantic attraction and emotional attraction. Right? Uh, somebody could uh, never have sex uh, with another person, but still have a sexual orientation and, and be uh, emotionally invested in someone of the opposite sex or the same sex or, or both. And that, in part, defines some aspect uh, uh, of their identity. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, you know, 
this class is about uh, disorders, and this is not a disorder. So why are we talking about it? Well, because the question is uh, the question is out there: uh, Should sex relation be a diagnosis? And it's out there because it was in the past in terms of a homosexual orientation. Heterosexual uh, 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 sexual orientation has never been a disorder. Right? We haven't pathologized that, but they have in the past they've pathologized uh, homosexual orientation. Um, so what do you think? Should people, uh, if they don't have a particular sexual orientation, uh, if it's not, if it's uh, statistically deviant, or if it's rare, or if it causes distress, so if somebody's upset about being heterosexual, and they, they wish they weren't, they're unsatisfied with relationships with people of the opposite sex, but they can't, they, they aren't happy with those relationships, but they can't bring themselves to be attracted to people of the same sex, right? should that be a disorder? Okay, what if they're uh, uh, unhappy with being attracted to people of the same sex, but they can't bring themselves to be attracted to people of the opposite sex? Should that be a disorder? Right? Well, it, it was. But pathologizing patterns of attraction does not seem to be consistent with uh, the rest of the disorders in DSM. Uh, we can certainly think about if we did start to pathologize uh, sexual uh, and romantic attraction, sexual orientation, we could think about other disorders that would probably need to go in there. You know, um, a disorder for heterosexual men that uh, seek out multiple sex partners with little regard for the feelings of their partners or safety concerns. I mean, that certainly would be associated with uh, uh, dysfunction, causing harm, uh, possibly distress, probably statistically deviant, uh, or maybe a disorder for people who choose to only have one sexual partner for a lifetime. You know, thus indicating an unnatural fear of sex and failure to develop a healthy repertoire of sexual knowledge and behaviors. Right? Once we start uh, um, using the power uh, of diagnoses to say how you're supposed to be, uh, it can get a little, it gets a slippery slope. And especially with things like where people aren't real comfortable agreeing on how you're supposed to be. And most of us can agree you're supposed to be happy. And that's one reason, one reason we pathologize depression. Dif more difficult to agree on how you're supposed to be attracted to people, who you're supposed to love. Right? Uh, this would be uh, a potential abuse of power if the majority pathologizes behaviors that it's uncomfortable or disagrees with, especially if those behaviors aren't associated with distress or dysfunction. Right? So if, if, if the majority of people decided one day that um, you know, it's, it's wrong to... Uh, um, to have uh, sex with somebody uh, you you love, because it just com com complicates things, confuses things, and you should only have sex with people you don't love. Therefore, if you um, uh, are, are sex attracted to people that you're in love with, that is pathology. Right? That would be an abuse of, of power. Um, okay. So, point being, uh, pathologizing sexual orientation uh, is a slippery slope. But as we talk about the other aspects of uh, um, sexual behavior. There is also a bit of slippery slope there too, and there is an imposition of value saying that here's how sex is supposed to be, here's what you're supposed to be attracted to, here's what you're not supposed to be attracted to, which the DSM does give those messages. Okay. Uh, before we move on to that, I just want to talk a little bit more about sexual orientation. Just, people often have questions uh, about it when we talk about uh, sex. Uh, Talking about the development of sexual orientation. So the question I usually ask uh, ask classes is, what's the cause of heterosexual orientation? Because right? most people say, well, what causes homosexuality? Well, back up. What causes heterosexuality? There's no um, biological reason for this to be an exclusive orientation. So, well, uh, you, evolution. If, if people weren't heterosexual, we wouldn't procreate. No. Bisexuality would, would accomplish that just fine. Uh, maybe even better. And you could talk about the reasons why bisexuality is an uh, evolutionary uh, superior mechanism, right? Because it would ensure uh, uh, interlocking patterns of relationships um, where you had uh, the, the physical procreation, but you also had relationships uh, between uh, uh, men to increase the security of the family, between women uh, to increase the nurturance of children, which increases the likelihood of uh, uh, children living uh, to reproductive age and then to reproduce, which is what evolutionary theory is all about. Um, <clears throat> so kind of from a scientific point of view, we don't know why people are, are, are heterosexual. 
um, or, or how you come to be that way. And, and uh, people haven't asked that question too much. There's just kind of the assumption that it's the right way because the majority of people, statistically speaking, are that way. Right? Um, but I, I say that to, to, to kind of make you, hopefully, uh, make you think, what causes sexual orientation in general, and not just what causes this one or that one, but what is it that drives us to be attracted to some other person, right? To have, uh, uh, to to be attracted to them, to want to have sex with them, to want to be intimate with them, to want to spend time with them, uh, to want to uh, share our feelings with this other person. Where does that come from? And like most things, it's probably a combination of uh, uh, genetics uh, and environment interacting over time. Right? Uh, most of the theories, though, about sexual orientation uh, are in reference to homosexual orientation. Uh, um, so we'll take just a, a brief look at those. Um, one is uh, looking at in utero hormone exposure. Um, you know, there's certain findings uh, that suggest that uh, this may play a role. Uh, you know, where the uh, a longer ring finger than a pointer finger in heterosexual men. Uh, um, uh, compared to uh, homosexual men, and also in uh, uh, masculine lesbians than uh, heterosexual women, but not not all lesbians. Uh, and then uh, gay men have less of a difference between uh, their fingers. Uh, uh, differences in hair whorls, you know, on the top of your head. Uh, and these are things uh, uh, that are influenced by uh, hormonal exposure, level of uh, testosterone that you're exposed to as a fetus. And so they're thinking, well, if there's this difference and there's a sexual orientation difference, there's this correlation, maybe they're both caused by hormones, right? And we also know that, it, uh, kind of with animal studies, if we androgenize female rats, you know, so when uh, these female rats are in utero, exposing them to, to high rates of testosterone, uh, we can uh, uh, change their behavior. They show an increased uh, female directed increase in female directed uh, sexual behavior. You know, the amount other female rats. Um, so some evidence for this, uh, but it's not always uh, consistent. Like the, you know, the finger differences and the hair roll differences, not true for everybody, but for some individuals that it may play a role. Um, like everything, some uh, genetic influence, um, and like most things else, it's probably more than just one gene. Uh, and a side note here, um, the, the GLBTQ community is, is am, ambivalent about the search for uh, a gene or, or kind of a, a biological determinant of sexual orientation. Um, so, well, if, if they found that, wouldn't they be happy? Uh, because then it's like, oh, it's not a choice, it's genetic. Uh, yes and no. There, there are some in the community that uh, feel that way, but there are others that say, well, if you find the gene, people aren't going to say, oh, here's the gene, you're born that way, accept it. People who are opposed to same-sex relationships and are uncomfortable with that aspect of sexuality will always be opposed to it, and they'll simply say, okay, here's the gene, it's a mutant gene, we've got to figure out a way to change that gene now. Right? Because it's clearly not the way things are supposed to be. Uh, so finding, uh, determining an exact cause, an exact biological cause, um, isn't going to change the way people, uh, some people, uh, feel. And it it's, has nothing to do with um, how people are born. It has to do with how comfortable people are with other people's uh, sexual behavior. Okay. Uh, one more theory, which is uh, uh, a little different. The, the exotic becomes erotic theory. Uh, and this is the idea that... Um, um, generally, when, when we're kids, uh, boys play with boys and girls play with girls. Right? And because if you're a, a boy, if, if you play always with boys, girls are different. So they're other. They're exotic because they're not like us. And there's just the difference is interesting. So the exotic becomes erotic. So that would kind of explain uh, typical heterosexual orientation development. Uh, but with... Uh, um, Individuals that uh, develop uh, homosexual uh, um, and, and lesbian sexual orientations as adults, uh, frequently they have some uh, cross-gender behavior as kids. And so we have boys playing more with girls and some girls who play more with boys. Uh, and when that happens, so if a boy is now playing mostly with girls, now the girls aren't uh, exotic. They're what's familiar. And so now boys the group that's over there is now different, is ex is exotic, and the exotic becomes erotic, and that's where the sexual orientation comes from. Right? So having to do with um, 
who you're uh, spending time with uh, as a child in your in your what's typically same sex playgroups uh, might not be uh, that might contribute in in some ways to uh, sexual orientation. But again, overall, nobody nobody knows for sure. Probably multiple things. Okay, moving on to uh, the disorders. Uh, so just an uh, overview here. Um, when we talk about sexual disorders, we're bringing them into three categories: uh, sexual dysfunctions, which can generally be broken down into uh, more categories in terms of uh, those that uh, are related to problems with a sexual desire phase, uh, those uh, related to sexual arousal, uh, problems with orgasm, uh, and then uh, pain related to sexual activity. And we also have the paraphilias, so being attracted to things that you shouldn't be attracted to. Uh, which we can generally break down into two categories: uh, object paraphilia, so attraction. The, uh, there's an ob, uh, object of the attraction that's not appropriate, so not a, a consensual, willing adult, but something or someone else, or an activity paraphilia, uh, where um, it's not some object, but some doing something. You know, exposing yourself would be an example of an activity uh, paraphilia. So arousal uh, occurs uh, only during uh, certain activities that aren't thought to be normal. And then the last category would be uh, gender identity disorder uh, or disorders if we think of it as a on a continuum. Okay, so let's uh, look at the um, uh, sexual dysfunctions first. But before, so we can look at the sexual dysfunctions, uh, they're all related to uh, uh, kind of a, a typical progression through the sexual response cycle, right? With the idea that biologically there's a certain way things are supposed to happen when you engage in sexual activity. And if you're experiencing sexual dysfunction, it's typically related to some problem getting through that cycle appropriately. Right? So let's talk about the cycle. You start off uh, with desire, right? which we generally uh, measure in terms of uh, uh, number and intensity of sexual fantasies and the subjective report of desire for sexual activity. Yeah, I'd like to have sex, or no, I'm not interested. So how interested are you in having sex? How often do you think about sex? And people uh, uh, differ, it seems to be on a continuum, how much uh, uh, desire they experience. And it's something that uh, uh, there are uh, some trait differences, but it's highly variable. It changes over the course of the day and over the course uh, of the year. Uh, more so for women than men. Uh, one of those things where women show more variability than, than men. Uh, and then it changes over the, the, the lifespan as well. But in general, there's some level, baseline level of desire there for, for normal sexual functioning. Uh, and then uh, if there's sufficient desire and there's a partner, then you begin sexual contact and you can enter the uh, excitement phase, right, where you have physiological arousal, um, uh, blood rushes to the genital organs, uh, and in women there's vaginal lubrication. So here's where uh, you're getting into uh, um, you know, physical contact with another person and your body's preparing for other parts uh, of the, the sexual experience. Right? And it's kind of uptick uh, of energy. Uh, and then, um, again, if things continue to go well for you, uh, you reach plateau. So arousal will continue to increase, but at a slower rate towards a pre-orgasm maximum point. So it's not just excitement, orgasm over, but it's excitement. You know, you go from just, I don't watch some TV to, oh, I'm feeling pretty good. And then being able to stay in that feeling pretty good uh, uh, um, zone for a while. Uh, and then if things continue to go well for you, reaching the orgasmic phase, which involves uh, rhythmic contraction uh, in, in the sex organs and in males uh, ejaculation. And as I mentioned before, subjectively orgasm is similar uh, in males and females. Uh, and the reason we know that, I think it's one of the more kind of interesting studies in terms of just the, the creativity of the methodology. Uh, um, so I always talk about it in terms of, you know, how do you figure out uh, if men and women experience orgasm similarly. Well, you could watch them, but that's kind of creepy. Uh, but even that, you you uh, may get some indicators of facial expressions, but in terms of what's it like for them inside their heads, well, you can only figure that out by asking them. And so if we ask them how what's yours and what's yours, and we get a bunch of stories, we can say, okay, are these alike? And you may do a good job of rating that. You may not, but probably if you say, okay, this is a woman's, this is a man's, uh, they don't seem that alike to me. Right? Because, and you may do that because you have biases, expecting that they're not going to be alike. Or maybe you say, yeah, I think they are, but you have biases that they are. So what do they do? They 
stripped the gender from the descriptions. They got a bunch of descriptions of men's and women's, and they knew what they were. But when that people rate them, you know, read the description of somebody's description of orgasm. Now decide if this is a, a man's description or a woman's description. And people were forced to make some decision. Uh, I think it's man. I think it's woman. And people were unable to reliably distinguish between men's, men's and women. So they looked at the piles they made, and they said, okay, how many, how many right did they get in this pile? How many right did they get in this pile? And it was random. They didn't uh, reliably uh, identify men's or women's. So it's kind of an interesting uh, methodology to identify um, that finding. Okay, so if things go well, again, orgasm, and then... Um, the, the last stage would be resolution, um, where arousal returns to, to normal levels. So again, uh, your heart rate slowing back down, uh, adrenaline, all that thing, coming back to uh, um, where you were before uh, um, excitement phase. Uh, and then there's a refractory period, which is a time during which further stimulation does not pro produce visible signs uh, of arousal. And this seems to be uh, uh, longer for men than women and more absolute uh, for for men uh, than women. Um, okay. So in terms of looking at this graphically, <coughs> excuse me, we can look at uh, path A would be uh, one example of successful progression through the sex response cycle. So uh, this is all assuming desire. So there's this up sudden upsurge uh, in excitement, uh, and then uh, plateau excitement increases, and then levels off, and then orgasm. And then uh, potentially for uh, uh, women, a uh, second one. And then either way, there's going to move through resolution where you move back down uh, pretty quickly through uh, the plateau and excitement phases to uh, pre-stimulation levels. Okay, so now we've got an idea of what the sexual response cycle is. Let's talk about the sexual dysfunctions. Uh, one, uh, sexual dysfunctions involve a uh, disturbance in the sexual response cycle or pain associated with sexual intercourse. Right. Um, in terms of uh, prevalence, highly prevalent, uh, more so than, than most other uh, disorders. Uh, estimates say, put it somewhere around 30% for men, maybe 40% for, for women uh, uh, lifetime. But you won't see a lot of them in treatment. It's one of those things that, that happens a, a lot but doesn't present very often to therapy. And when it does pre present for, for therapy, it's kind of uh, after they've already gone through probably uh, uh, buying uh, remedies they found online or on TV, uh, going and seeing their physician, and then eventually they'll make their way to uh, a therapist. Excuse me. Um, to to uh, be diagnosed as a disorder, it must cause distress or uh, interpersonal difficulty. So if somebody you know is just not interested in sexual activity and uh, they don't have a partner who resents them for that, uh, then they don't have a disorder. You know if they don't they don't like sex don't don't want to have sex and there's nobody expecting them to have sex such that it doesn't cause interpersonal difficulty, uh, then it's not a disorder. Even though they may have kind of similar symptoms to somebody else if they were in a relationship, uh, we don't pathologize it if it doesn't uh, doesn't bother them. It doesn't cause uh, any kind of problems. Uh, clinical judgment plays a role in diagnosis of all disorders, but it really takes on a prominent role with these disorders because the clinician is tasked with judging uh, if the problem is clinically significant while considering the context of the problem. You know, for example, if a client can't get aroused, they have a, a arousal disorder, the clinician has to consider if uh, this is because uh, the partner is not stimu the, the partner uh, of the client is not stimulating enough. Maybe they're not attractive enough. You know, um, they have to determine if the uh, arousal experience is consistent with the typical level for that person's age and culture and all that stuff. Right? Um, and beyond that, uh, people with, with uh, sexual problems of some degree often want better sex. Right? But just because somebody's dissatisfied with their uh, sexual experience, sexual behavior, doesn't mean they have a sexual uh, dysfunction. They may just be having bad sex. But again, if, if that's the case, it doesn't preclude intervention or treatment. You know, a, a sex therapist can help them learn to have better sex, but they're not necessarily uh, uh, diagnosable, right? unless they're kind of down uh, below a certain threshold. That threshold is determined via, usually, clinical judgment. 
right? There aren't, it isn't uh, clear rules, right? Okay, uh, like we talk, talk about, um, you know, sexual uh, or an orgasmic disorder, you know, uh, failure to have an orgasm. So how long do they have to be in plateau before uh, and not have an orgasm before we say, okay, that's too long to be in plateau, not have an orgasm, you clearly have a disorder. Uh, clinical judgment. There's no, it's not 10 minutes, not 20 minutes, not an hour. Nobody has any rules. You just have to uh, make that decision based on uh, what the research says at the moment and on your, your clinical experience. <clears throat> so prominent role of clinical judgment. Uh, in terms of comorbidity, often one sexual dysfunction may lead to another, either in that individual or, or uh, in their partner. Right? Um, so having one sexual dysfunction uh, may cause another one. But also, uh, we might have, like, uh, uh, if one partner has a hypoactive sexual desire, where they're just not interested in having sex, the other partner may develop uh, erectile dysfunction in response to that. Right? So these things, uh, um, not uncommon to find comorbidities uh, in an individual and also in a couple because um, they're very interpersonal disorders. Uh, specifiers you can apply to any of the uh, dysfunctions. Uh, one, you specify if it's lifelong versus acquired, and obviously lifelong isn't uh, since birth, but lifelong being since the onset of sexual functioning or not. Uh, and in general, uh, better prognosis associated with acquire, uh, acquired versus lifelong. So if you didn't have a problem until this partner or until this happened, you know, you, they lost a job or whatever, something happened, Okay, better prognosis than if they've always had this problem. Um, generalized versus situational. So, uh, again, is it just certain partners or certain situations? And if so, if it's uh, situational, better prognosis than if it's generalized. If that doesn't matter uh, who I'm having sex with, if it's uh, uh, intercourse with a person or, or masturbation, always have the same problem, that would be generalized uh, and that would be um, more problematic or more, more difficult to treat. And then uh, due to psychological factors versus combined factors, with combined being psychological and, and medical slash biological. So to be a disorder, psychological factors must play some role. Uh, medical conditions can be present and often are present, but uh, if it's a disorder, those medical conditions aren't sufficient to account for all the symptoms. Right? Uh, so if, it's, if the dysfunction is solely due to a medical condition, then it's not a disorder not a psychological disorder. It's a medical problem. But more often what we see is there's a medical condition that contributes to it, but it can't fully explain the symptoms. And there's, there are psychological factors related to the, the onset, the exasperation, exacerbation uh, um, of the symptoms. So if it's both, it's combined. If it's just psychological, there's no, nothing medical going on that can be determined, it would be due to psychological factors. Um, okay. So the actual uh, dysfunctions themselves, uh, the sexual desire disorders, two of those, uh, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. This is a, a persistent and recurrent uh, deficiency or absence of sexual fantasies and desire for sexual activity. Right? So hypoactive, less than active, so no desire. Right? Uh, important to keep in mind here that there may be uh, some, some fairly stable gender differences in the expression and mechanisms uh, of desire. Some women who don't really suffer from any pathology may have low levels of uh, spontaneous desire, where they're just not, not walking around going, well, I want to have sex, I want to have sex, think about sex all the time. But they may still have ample responsive desire, to whereas if their partner says, hey, honey, and uh, makes any kind of romantic gesture or sexual gesture, their desire suddenly uh, increases. So they're not, uh, uh, and that, that may be more, uh, more typical, more normal for women, whereas men... Uh, tend to have high levels of spontaneous uh, desire. Uh, you know, men tend to, to think about sex uh, on average spontaneously more than women. So uh, that when you're diagnosing this, um, you may have to think about it a little differently when looking at a male client or, or a female client. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then the sexual aversion disorder, which is uh, different. Uh, and... and sort of fits with the desire disorders, but it doesn't fit as well. Uh, this is when uh, characterized by an aversion to an active avoidance of genital sexual contact with a sexual partner. Okay. So this is not just, I don't, I'm not interested, it's, no, I don't want to have sex. And so 
not not just a lack of interest, but a strong negative reaction to genital contact. Right? Uh, and they may experience, uh, if they do try to have sexual contact, uh, either uh, because it's they're coerced to or they feel obligated to uh, for some partner, uh, um, they'll uh, may experience moderate anxiety to possibly even a full panic attack during sex. Uh, and, and this might be problems at the desire phase or uh, might be problems at the excitement phase. You know, one, one theory is that uh, the excitement that happens at the excitement phase, maybe they, they generally maybe want to have sex, it scares them, but still want to. But as they get excited uh, uh, and your heart rate speeds up and all that stuff, that those bodily cues may be misread uh, uh, as uh, anxiety and cause more anxiety and panic, and then that contributes to kind of almost, almost like a phobia uh, of sex. It's not sex phobia, but it may, it may work that way for some people. But there also may be uh, other reasons uh, related to their their um, clinical history why they have strong aversion to uh, genital sexual contact, you know, previous uh, abusive experiences. Um, but again, not wanting to have sex. So, but the difference between aversion, sexual aversion disorder, and hypoactive sexual desire: one, not interested; the other, negatively interested. So, anti. Uh, and usually scared of anxiety associated with the idea of, of genital contact. Uh, and then the sexual arousal disorders. Um, the DSM notes that uh, a diagnosis is not merited unless you can determine that the arousal difficulty isn't due to uh, sexual stimulation that is not adequate in focus, intensity, and duration. Right. So again, this is why I said clinical judgment comes in. You have to figure out, okay, they're not uh, experiencing enough arousal. Is that because that their sexual stimulation isn't adequate enough in, in focus, intensity, or duration? So is, do they have a lousy lover? And that's part of your decision making in making a diagnosis, which is uh, a bit of a burden on, on many uh, clinicians. But you know, if they have a lousy lover, then it's, it's not a disorder. Um, so, looking at uh, line D could be one uh, one example of sexual arousal disorder. So, uh, maybe getting a little excited, but really not uh, not enough. So there's there's desire, but um, problems getting aroused enough. Or it could be like uh, line B, <clears throat> where they get excited, but um, well, line B. But imagine if that line came down uh, much uh, more quickly didn't stay in plateau uh, very long. So uh, not only do they not reach orgasm, but they don't stay in plateau uh, long enough. It may not even reach uh, plateau. So th the disorders themselves, female sexual arousal uh, disorder, um, diagnostically is a persistent and recurrent inability to attain or to maintain until completion of sexual activity an adequate lubrication swelling response of sexual excitement. Right. So either, again, either they can't get excited, so they want to have sex, but body's not responding when they start having physical contact, or they can't stay in plateau. So um, they uh, they get excited, but it doesn't, uh, their body doesn't keep, doesn't maintain the lubrication, the physical response, which would then probably lead to, to painful sex. Uh, but notice here that the DSM really focuses on the physical, and it ignores a woman's subjective sense of arousal, which, uh, importantly, might not match her body's response. So uh, a woman could, her body could be responding in terms of uh, uh, adequate lubrication and swelling, but really not be uh, aroused subjectively. So the body is doing its thing, but the mind is going, no, this, I'm kind of bored. Right? Uh, and using the strict definition of DSM, wouldn't meet criteria for sexual arousal disorder. But clinically speaking, probably could benefit from uh, uh, treatment if there really is no arousal. The body's doing its thing, but the mind's going, no, not not excited, and, and sex is not pleasurable. That's still a, a clinically, possibly clinically significant problem uh, and would probably uh, merit the same type of intervention that uh, female sexual arousal disorder would. Uh, in men, the diagnosis would be male erectile disorder, uh, also referred to uh, um, more commonly as erectile dysfunction, or ED. And you see all those commercials if you watch uh, uh, any sporting event now. Uh, you'll see commercials for um, uh, certain pills 
uh, to, to treat your ED. Um, and this is the sexual dysfunction that most men uh, seeking treatment present with. It's not the most common sexual dysfunction in men. Uh, that would be um, premature ejaculation but they don't seek treatment for that. This is the one that they seek treatment for. Um, and diagnostically, it's a persistent or recurrent inability to attain or maintain until completion of sexual activity and adequate erection. Right, so again, focusing on the, the biological aspect uh, of arousal. And when they say until the completion of sexual, sexual activity, it's until their completion, not necessarily they and their partner are both finishing, but uh, they aren't able um, to complete se their, their role in the sexual activity. Um, uh, with an adequate erection. Um, and again, it ignores the subjective experience uh, and focuses only on the, uh, the physical experience. Okay, then uh, move on to the uh, orgasmic disorders. <clears throat> so people maybe uh, have, have desire. They're able to have uh, excitement uh, and arousal and able to be in a plateau for a while. Oh, well, they're able to reach uh, that plateau level uh, of excitement and then something happens uh, where the orgasm uh, doesn't occur when they would like it to. Uh, so for our, our, our cycle it would be uh, B or C. So B they have excitement, plateau, um, ups and downs, downs, but never reach that orgasm level and eventually return to resolution without experiencing an orgasm. And then C is the sudden uptick in excitement, uh, another sudden uptick in plateau, and then boom, orgasm uh, right away without staying in plateau uh, very long uh, at all. Okay. So it, it, orgasm sort of is either uh, uh, too long without achieving an orgasm or achieving an orgasm too early. Um, so for uh, uh, the um, too long, it's either female orgasmic disorder or male orgasmic disorder. Two separate disorders that have them lumped together here because it saves space. Uh, and they have the same definition. It's a persistent and recurrent delay in or absence of orgasm following a normal sexual excitement phase. Uh, so again, what is a normal sexual excitement phase? Uh, no rules about that. Consult the research and your clinical experience. So basically, it's a problem getting from plateau to orgasm. And again, there is an important gender difference here. It's easier for men to reach orgasm uh, than women. So when trying to figure out if there was sufficient sexual stimulation right, to reach orgasm, because that's part of it. If there wasn't sufficient sexual stimulation, then it, it's not this disorder. Right? It's a, a problem with uh, your sexual behavior uh, or your partner. Uh, there, there are differences. You know, women will require more sexual stimulation uh, than men to, to reach orgasm. And you've got to take that into account, too, when, when figuring out if it's uh, a pathology or not. Uh, and the other one, the too soon, would be premature ejaculation, which uh, only diagnosed in men. There is no uh, uh, premature orgasm disorder uh, among women. Um, but for men, uh, premature ejaculation is a persistent, uh, recurrent, onset of orgasm and ejaculation with minimal sexual stimulation before, on, or shortly after penetration and before the person, person wishes it. Okay. Uh, the majority of individuals with this uh, can delay uh, a bit longer while masturbating, but they still uh, ejaculate sooner than controls. Uh, so then uh, the question is, well, how soon is too soon? Because, you know, part of it is, uh, interestingly, before they wish it. So if, if they don't mind, if the person doesn't mind it at all, uh, it wouldn't be a disorder, even if their partner was greatly disappointed. Uh, but uh, shortly after penetration, how, how soon? DSM doesn't say. But uh, some sex, ther sex therapists got together and, and talked about it, and they suggested uh, a one minute uh, or less would be too soon. Right? And... Uh, but in other research, the average time uh, with vaginal intercourse before ejaculation is four to eight minutes. Um, so uh, one minute definitely, less than four minutes possibly uh, qualify for uh, diagnosis. Uh, but again, someone who's, uh, this is very subjective, someone who's uh, maybe uh, having uh, intercourse for eight minutes and they're ejaculating, but it's, they, it's too soon for them, so there's a subjective sense, they want it to be longer may not be a disorder, but again, that doesn't negate the fact that uh, th there might be a successful intervention in teaching them the same techniques that you teach somebody uh, who uh, ejaculated after a minute 
to, to delay uh, ejaculation and prolong sexual intercourse. Um, but again, technically wouldn't merit uh, a diagnosis. Uh, and then last, we have the sexual pain uh, disorders, and two different disorders that differ kind of in regard to the locus of pain, but they may be difficult to discriminate in the real world because people may just say, well, it hurts when I have sex, and they have a hard time telling you exactly how how it hurts. Uh, Dyspareunia is uh, genital pain associated with sexual intercourse, and it can occur in uh, males or females. And then uh, vaginismus uh, is obviously only diagnosable in, in women. Uh, it's a recurrent and persistent involuntary contraction of the perineal muscles surrounding the outer third of the vagina, which contract normally during orgasm. But in vaginismus, uh, they contract uh, when vaginal penetration is attempted. And uh, typically, when vaginal penetration with anything, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, penis, uh, um, uh, sexual toy, uh, uh, going to the doctor, you know, speculum, uh, um, whatever. Uh, and the problem uh, may uh, be related to problems at the excitement phase in terms of the muscles contracting uh, uh, too early. Uh, but notably, if no penetration is attempted, progression through the other phases of the sexual response cycle is still possible. So uh, the woman uh, suffering from vaginismus, if uh, her partner doesn't attempt penetration, she might still be able to achieve uh, excitement plateau and orgasm, just not with uh, uh, Vaginal penetration. Um, okay, before we talk about the etiology, the last thing to note is that um, there are currently no diagnoses uh, uh, related to problems with the resolution phase in the DSM in terms of, oh, uh, I reached, uh, didn't reach resolution, I stayed in orgasm way too long. Nobody has complained about that enough yet to, to make it a disorder. Uh, but who knows? And there are some reports of... Uh, um, People co reporting complaints of chronic sexual arousal, where they're having the the, uh, the sexual arousal response uh, at inappropriate times or longer than they would uh, like to have it when they're not intending to have sex, uh, but currently not not in the DSM. Okay. Uh, we talk about uh, etiology again. Like I said before, it can't be just medical, but typically, uh, or not typically, but frequently. Uh, there is some medical uh, influence, and the medical influences can be a lot of things. Could be uh, a disease, for example, diabetes, um, and any anything that's related to uh, the cardiovascular system, or that can influence hormone levels, likely to uh, influence uh, the sexual response cycle. Uh, treatment of diseases or other disorders uh, often is associated with uh, dysfunction, especially uh, drug treatments. Uh, in, in our field, we know that some of the SSRIs uh, lead to sexual dysfunction, either uh, changes in desire, hypoactive sexual desire, uh, and possibly also um, problems with uh, the arousal phase of the sexual response cycle. Um, injuries, um, with the, the biggest one being a spinal cord injury, where there's um, uh, loss of sensation in certain body parts or uh, difficulty with uh, the nerves sending messages to where they need to go uh, in the body um, obviously could influence um, the sexual response cycle. Uh, intra-psychic influence, things going on within the person, uh, their attitudes towards sex, so uh, more uh, negative, fearful uh, um, uh, beliefs about sex often associated with uh, sexual difficulties, people who are less comfortable talking about, thinking about uh, sex, more likely to have difficulties than people who are, uh, are more comfortable uh, and more uh, maybe liberal in their sexual attitudes. Uh, stress and, and uh, anxiety, so kind of chronic stress influences uh, um, uh, desire and also arousal. Uh, and then anxiety can influence desire and arousal, but can also influence the ability to uh, reach orgasm, either both ways, either uh, leading to uh, too soon of an orgasm or uh, inability to achieve orgasm because of uh, anxiety about uh, performance. Uh, depression, um, strongly linked to, to sexual dysfunction. Um, not surprisingly, because you know one of the things about depression is uh, loss of interest in uh, pleasurable events. Well, uh, that would be sex, right? Uh, and then uh, self-esteem, how a person feels about themselves uh, is strongly tied to um, their sexual behavior. So. Uh, Feeling good about yourself seems to be uh, important uh, to having uh, to successfully navigating the, the sexual response cycle. Um, 
and then like often the 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 biggest influence is interpersonal influences and uh, maybe a short list but it's kind of i think it's the most important list uh in the biggest thing being intimacy issues and this intimacy issue is secondary to all kinds of things uh infidelity uh anger communication problems um if two people um aren't uh, emotionally intimate it's more difficult for them to be physically intimate because we know that sex isn't isn't strictly a biological thing it's very much a biological emotional cognitive you know it is a very psychological uh, uh phenomenon uh, and so if uh, things aren't right psychologically between two people, it's difficult for it to be um, right between them uh, sexually. Uh, and then also, um, just kind of uh, behaviorally, there may be skill deficits either with the client or the partner that are contributing to uh, the dysfunction. Okay, okay. moving on to uh, the paraphilias. <clears throat> so DSM uh, general diagnostic, diagnostic uh, criteria for a uh, paraphilic disorder uh, six months of intense sexually arousing uh, fantasies urges or behaviors uh, involving either uh, non-human objects or the suffering or humiliation of yourself or a partner or children or some other non-consenting person okay so important thing to note here, uh, here uh, is that you don't have to act on your urges to meet criteria so we often think about, oh, somebody has a paraphilia, they have, uh, you know, uh, uh, pedophilia, exhibitionism, whatever. They have to have done the thing, the behavior, to be diagnosed. Uh, and largely, no. Uh, they typically have, but they don't have to to meet criteria. As long as they have the desires and urges, they might meet criteria. But if you just have the desires and urges, that's not enough. You have to have the desires and urges, and they are distressing. You have to be bothered. So if somebody uh, has fantasies about exposing themselves, but they never never do it, never get in trouble with the law for it, and it doesn't bother them, they're kind of, oh, yeah, I kind of like to think about that, and it you know, makes me happy. Not a disorder. Okay. Um, so you don't have to exhibit the behavior, but it does need to cause distress. So disturbance causes distress or interpersonal difficulty. And the interpersonal difficulty is important, uh, obviously, because... Um, sex is a very interpersonal act so if uh think about uh sadomasochism where one person likes to uh, in, inflict uh, uh pain humiliation humiliation the other person likes to experience pain and humiliation if two people are in a relationship and they both uh, accept their roles and are, uh, enjoy it it doesn't cause interpersonal difficulty it doesn't cause distress those behaviors would not be a disorder in that couple now if they broke up and tried to do other people they suddenly might have a disorder uh, in terms of uh, prevalence, we don't have any good numbers uh, on this. Most of the stats we have on paraphilias are based on sex offenders, which obviously sex offenders are very much a, a biased sample. It's people who have um, obviously uh, have sexual urges and then have uh, have had the inability to um, restrain themselves and have violated uh, the laws and rights of others uh, to meet their sexual urges. Okay. Uh, but fairly rare. Um, but we do know that um, it's predominantly men. Almost 99% uh, of paraphiliacs are, are men, with the exception of masochism. Uh, for masochists, uh, it's almost an equal gender split between uh, men and women. Otherwise, very rare to find women who uh, suffer from or meet criteria for uh, a paraphilia. Okay. In terms of uh, some of the paraphilias that are in the DSM, they include uh, exhibitionism, which involves uh, you know intense sexual arousing fantasies, urges, or behaviors involving exposing of one's genitals to a stranger. Um, and the stranger part of that seems to be important. So it's not just exposing yourself. You know, if I expose myself to my partner, get turned on. No, it has to be to a stranger. Uh, and frequently, then they'll go, uh, they'll get aroused by that, uh, and then um, go uh, masturbate to uh, to finish. Um, and again, it's a disorder, not because, oh, this is what turns them on, because they can't get turned on. They can't work through the sexual response cycle without doing this. Okay. Uh, fetishism which involves the uh, the use of non-living objects. Um, 
so here's where the instead of a person being the object of desire it's something uh, panties or shoes uh, maybe material leather um, again with again we have this kind of uh, cultural belief that sex should be about people and if you're sex attracted to something that's not a person that's uh, pathological um, but again if uh, if they're not in a relation to somebody or they're in a relation to somebody who doesn't mind that and it doesn't bother them not a disorder uh, frauderism uh, this is uh, touching and rubbing against a non-consenting persons usually in public so you know people that will go uh, in elevators uh, subways and uh, rub up against someone to achieve arousal and then they'll go off in a corner again and, and probably masturbate to, to finish but they can't get aroused unless they they do that uh, pedophilia um, with uh, prepubescent children uh, being attracted to uh, aroused by them uh, if they're uh, pubescent kids adolescents uh, it'd be uh, hebophilia which statistically may be more of a, a problem in the states anyway but uh, again this is one of the things where uh, they don't have to have acted on it to uh, meet criteria if they're distressed by it uh, if they're not distressed by it and they've never gotten in trouble for it it wouldn't be a, a disorder yeah um, important to note that that not all child abusers are pedophiles and not all pedophiles are, are child abusers they're not the same term uh, sometimes child abuse occurs because the person is attracted to, to children sometimes it occurs for other reasons having to do with uh, power having to do with uh, just somebody who's sexually frustrated and availability of uh, a victim uh, and then again some people who are, are pedophiles are able to not act on their urges and um, are not child abusers but there certainly is overlap between those, those two groups uh, sexual masochism this is when an individual wants to be humiliated, beaten, bound, or otherwise made to suffer, uh, which interestingly uh, occurs disproportionately among really wealthy people, wealthy white men. Uh, sexual sadism, uh, people who are excited by the physical uh, suffering of a victim, and the partner may or may not be willing. So again, if a, a sadist partners with a, a masochist, they may be uh, happy together. Um, Transvestic fetishism. Uh, this is uh, diagnostically required to be a heterosexual male that gets aroused by cross dressing. Uh, and they may have gender dysphoria, but not necessarily. Uh, and um, diagnostically, it's interesting that they require the sexual orientation to be heterosexual. And that seems to be predominantly what happens. And whenever uh, homosexual men cross dress, it's not for the purpose of sexual arousal. It's for the purpose of uh, entertainment, you know, kind of drag queens, which is more of a cultural phenomenon and not about sex. But there are some data, data that suggest that uh, there may be some uh, homosexual men that get aroused by cross dressing. But as the DSM is now, uh, they wouldn't meet criteria for transvestic fetishism. Uh, voyeurism, uh, people that uh, like to observe unsuspecting individuals who are naked, disrobing, or having sex. <clears throat> and then, uh, so those are the categories that are in the DSM, but uh, as you read in your other book, there are lots of others, uh, which would generally be diagnosed as paraphilia, not otherwise specified. So uh, necrophilia, coprophilia, all those other, uh, and there are uh, innumerable uh, objects and activities that um, people uh, are aroused by or required to engage in to become aroused that aren't considered normal uh, and if those things uh, involve distress or interpersonal difficulty then they are diagnosable as a, a paraphilia in terms of the, the ideology uh, very this is a very uh, diverse group and um, one that's uh, not well studied not surprisingly often people uh, experience uh, shame related to their um, sexual behavior if they uh, if they believe it is uh, a deviant if if most people don't seem to be this way they're not going to talk about it so it, uh, we don't know that much about them um, but we do know it seems to be uh, different ideologies for different people and for different um, types of perfidus depending on the object or the activity maybe a different ideology uh, some evidence um, suggesting there may be some atypical brain development in utero in terms of uh, there's a relation between handedness and paraphilia, you know, being left-handed uh, because if you're right-handed or left-handed, that's not uh, uh, genetic, it's 
more so related to uh, hormone exposure in utero. Uh, and uh, paraphilias are disproportionately left-handed. Which, again, if you're left-handed, doesn't mean you have a paraphilia. Uh, but it could be that uh, whatever hormone exposure caused left-handedness might also have uh, disrupted something related to um, sexual uh, functioning. But thin evidence and, and very correlational at this point. But there may be something different about uh, the way their brains are wired. Uh, family variables. Uh, abuse history uh, is not uncommon. Uh, it's not always, uh, but certainly uh, more than the general population. Um, um, and not just, uh, uh, you may think, oh, well, sexual abuse. Yeah, but other types of uh, physical abuse and, and neglect uh, as well. Um, often, especially with uh, the uh, pedophilia, there's an inability to maintain normal adult sexual relations, so they, they lack social interpersonal skills, um, and uh, are, you know, everybody's born with, uh, or not everybody, most people are born with a desire to have sex, and some people, because of different uh, interpersonal deficits, aren't able to successfully have sex with appropriate targets. And that's, that's the reported history for many people who suffer from paraphilia, is that uh, it didn't work out so well trying to have normal sex and that led to uh, um, the development of um, this other uh, other target or activity um, and then learning theories also suggest um, uh, that uh, there may be some uh, you know, classical operant conditioning principles uh, involved here in terms of uh, the association of objects with pleasure. So if somebody has a pleasurable uh, experience, uh, sexual otherwise, and there's some object that's in the forefront of their mind at the time, that object may be tied to, conditioned, you know, uh, to be related to the experience of pleasure, and then they forget the other part that caused the actual pleasure, and they just focus on that, that object. And that may explain some of the stuff, but again, not real sure because it's, it's hard to do research with these individuals. Uh, okay. The last one, uh, gender identity disorder, um, which is a uh, very, but there's just, there's just one disorder in the DSM, and the criteria are uh, a strong and persistent cross-gender identification. Okay. So uh, identifying with uh, the gender that's uh, opposite of your biological sex. Okay. A persistent discomfort with the sense of inappropriateness in, in gender role. No, I, I don't feel like I, everybody's treating me like I'm supposed to be a man, but I don't feel like a man. Everybody's treating me like a woman, but I don't feel like I'm supposed to be a woman. I don't doesn't feel right. And the person is not physically intersexed. Right? The old term that's no longer used uh, that you might be more familiar with would be a uh, hermaphrodite, hermaphroditic. Um, term now is intersexed, which is a, a very broad category um, where somebody isn't uh, uh, doesn't fall easily into the dichotomy of clearly male, clearly female, either because of uh, uh, genetics, not, not simply X, X or XY, but maybe XXY, um, um, or other genetic vari variabilities, or they may not have, um, uh, they may have ambiguous genitalia, or they may have both, may have one testicle and one ovary. Uh, what are lots of different ways to be inter intersex? But if you're intersex, you can't have <laughs> gender identity disorder. Uh, I don't know. Well, because according to the DSM, um, you should be confused about your gender, uh, and so not a disorder. Uh, so it can't be physically intersexed, and the disturbance must cause clinically significant distress or impairment in important areas uh, of functioning. Um, in terms of uh, prevalence, rare, really rare. Uh, maybe 1 in 12,000 for male to female transsexuals, 1 in maybe 40,000 for female to male. So slightly more common uh, in... in well, more common in, in men than women, but uh, very rare uh, in both. Uh, for the etiology, unknown. Uh, it's presumed uh, to be biological. And we, we base that primarily on uh, some very unfortunate um, experiments uh, that, have, that have happened in terms of uh, trying to assign people, uh, assign uh, gender. Uh, and you think, well, why would people assign somebody's gender? Well, there. A while back, there were a couple of incidents where, um, and one kind of stands out of my mind where uh, there was a, a, a an infant that was born, uh, in the um, this was back in the 60s, I think, and they went to uh, from the circumcision, and the the surgeon uh, ablated the penis, destroyed the penis accidentally, 
and at the time, the the doctor said, "Well, we can't reconstruct the penis, but you know what we can do? We can uh, uh, make a pocket here, create a, a a vagina, and you can just raise him as a girl. It's just a baby, and uh, you know, gender is socially constructed, um, and it's all based on environments. So just raise him as a girl, and uh, we'll give him hormones. We'll we'll create the body to be feminine. You know, that can grow breasts, no problem." And they said, oh, okay. And there was a psychologist involved who was very shady, ethically, uh, and uh, attempted to do this. Uh, and, and long story short, um, when the child grew up um, and he was very uncomfortable with his assigned gender, you know, and they never told him, or at that time they didn't tell him what happened, but he just knew something felt wrong. He didn't feel uh, like a woman. Right? So his gender, even though biologically looking down, he could say, oh, I'm a girl. But inside his head, did not feel like a girl. Treated like a girl, wore dresses, didn't fit. So there, there's this thing, uh, apparently, that you have this sense of your gender that's independent of what people tell you and what you see in your body. Right? And, and that uh, gentleman eventually uh, killed himself. Um, so given that we can't uh, apparently assign people uh, gender, and there does seem to be kind of this uh, biological basis for your identity that isn't tied to uh, how the world treats you completely or tied to what you see when you look at your genitals. Maybe some of these individuals uh, have some biological difference in their brain where they really do uh, uh, experience themselves as, as a gender inconsistent with um, their uh, um, how, how they've been treated and what their um, genitals tell them. And again, it's something that uh, we don't, there, it's so rare, not a lot of research, but uh, the uh, the gender discomfort appears very early in life, which suggests uh, some biological ideology. Uh, and there, there aren't, it's not like every story comes out, oh, they're, they're all victims of sexual abuse. That's not at all uh, the case. Um, so there aren't, isn't like this big red flag of, of traumas or some uh, psychosocial variable. So it seems like something probably uh, very biological, exactly what it is. We don't know. So the next question is, should this be a diagnosis? And then there's a bit of controversy about whether or not this should be in the DSM uh, or not um, as a, a, a disorder. So there, there's something uh, uh, wrong with you if you have cross-gender identification. And uh, some people make the argument, well, it's not a disorder unless it causes distress or impairment. Um, so if people are fine with it, you know, if you feel like, well, I'm a woman trapped in this man, a man's body, uh, and that's who I am, and just deal with the people, then it's not a disorder. The problem is the world that uh, we live in will inevitably uh, cause someone <laughs> distress and impairment uh, who feels that way. Uh, we're not uh, well equipped to, to respond to uh, transsexual uh, uh, in, in gender identity individuals. Um, so we will cause them distress uh, and impairment. Um, if you think, yeah, it should be a diagnosis, then the next question is, what's the goal uh, of treatment? Is it to uh, get rid of their cross-gender identification? To them, oh, this is your body, you're stuck with it, let's teach you how to be a man, let's teach you how to be a woman. Or is it, okay, let's figure out how to reduce your distress and impairment and get your body to look more like um, how you see yourself on the inside. And the latter tends to be... Um, the goal that's uh, more commonly pursued uh, and supported in the uh, psychological community. Um, okay, uh, summing up, uh, when we talk about the sexual uh, disorders, it's generally something about having problems with uh, either the ability to enjoy sex, uh, problems with who or what turns you on, such that uh, who or what turns you on causes interpersonal difficulties or you know, gets you in trouble. Or just as a society, we've decided that that's wrong and you shouldn't be uh, aroused by that. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or uh, maybe diagnosed related to sexuality based on how you view uh, your gender. Uh, and then the kind of the biggest thing for me with these disorders is the, the really the role of clinical judgment uh, is is more prominent here than with any other disorder. Uh, with a, a very kind of um, uh, sensitive issue that uh, there are diverse opinions and divergent opinions on what is uh, normal or, or typical uh, sexuality. So there's a, a really a strong possibility here for um, 
the abuse of power, given that there's, there, there's not, uh, they're not many agreed upon. This is uh, uh, normal sex. This is not normal sex. And so there's this really strong possibility for abuse of power where one individual clinician can impose his or her own views of what is normal, acceptable, appropriate on other individuals. So I caution you to uh, wield your power wisely. All right. Uh, that's all for now. Take care.